Today I'll be talking about virtuality, storytelling, and uh, self. And to, towards introducing that, first I'll introduce a new endeavor that we have going on at campus here that I've been uh, heading up these last uh, months. So the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality is a new initiative that pioneers experiences using technologies of virtuality. These are computing systems that paint a layer of imagination atop the physical world. You could ask why we call it the Center for Advanced Virtuality, well, for us, the advanced is not only the technology, it's also pushing forward the socio-cultural impact and modeling of these kind of systems. And virtuality is not just limited to VR headsets, as I'll mention in just a second. It's a kind of this broader array of technologies that create these kind of immersive experiences. Some of the unique hallmarks of what we do include our approach to engineering and creative practices. We, end to, we aim to push the expressive potential of technologies of virtuality. We simulate social and cognitive phenomena using AI techniques. And we intrinsically consider the social and cultural impacts of our work. And you'll see what I mean by that in uh, just a moment. And as I mentioned, virtuality for us is not just uh, VR. And I think that's something that we share with uh, Sense.Nano and uh, uh, the perspective on virtuality that's taken there. For us, it's not uh, just mixed reality, augmented reality, even, uh, mixed, uh, uh, even uh, VR and so forth. It includes any system in which you have a, a computational world, a virtual world, or a computational proxy for the self. So besides these kind of systems, we also consider these types of systems as systems of virtuality. Perhaps a symptomatic of this is uh, Facebook's acquiring of uh, Oculus. So today I'll just focus on a little bit of what we do, that uh, systems that are interactive narratives, although we also do AI-based analysis of social worlds, video games, and virtual worlds, and uh, so on. For example, big data studies of how people use social media across the Middle East and North Africa to find the kind of patterns of use so there are proving in mainstream best-selling video games that they're not suited for certain audiences. For example, we used AI techniques to show that, called, one called archetypal analysis, to show that the best-selling video game, which on the first day of release made $217 million, but for contrast, you can say Star Wars on its Best Weekend made $24.9 million, so about a factor of nine you know, less of this video game. We showed if you play as a female character, you're disadvantaged to play the intelligence-oriented character archetype, the strength-oriented character archetype. You're, in fact, only optimized to play as the thief. Right? So that analysis side is a whole other side of our work. If you're interested, I could talk more about that later. So when I started studying AI and interactive uh, narrative, and I should say a bit about myself. You know, my background, my PhD, was from computer science and engineering, but I also did a master's in interactive, interactive telecommunications and the arts, and two bachelors, one in logic and computer science and one in the art. And while I was studying from a bachelor's degree, it felt that really people were trying to envision strictly the holodeck from Star Trek The Next Generation. That is, you can go into a virtual world and no matter what you do, you get a kind of compelling story, for example, a Sherlock Holmes story, in which you can't break the story no matter what you do. So instead of only this kind of immersive, uh, this kind of immersive approach that is spatially immersive, what I was really interested in is how you can use AI techniques to automatically change stories in terms of the socio-political perspectives of the users, the cultural worldviews of the users, the theme, metaphor to best, serve, to best serve the current user, or even the emotional tone, and other types of subject, subjective factors such as this. So we really needed some semantic hooks into the underlying system so we could make these kind of changes on the fly and personalize stories for users. So the problem with this is that story content is quite challenging because it's highly situation sensitive, that's context dependent, it's you know, when we try to construct these kind of meanings, we're trying to make them relevant to users, but users, of course, bring their own interpretive affordances to the system. Also, there's a kind of bias in engineering sometimes where these kind of issues that are seen as subjective aren't also seen as amenable to computational approaches. So what we needed were formal computational approaches toward providing salient, culturally, and aesthetically rich systems. 
So I'll talk just about two systems that we've created that are quite different. The first is a kind of workplace learning system, which is a technology of virtuality in the sense that you construct a virtual identity within it. The system is called uh, Grayscale. So Grayscale was implemented using a custom platform for building interactive narratives called Chimeria. And the core of Chimeria is a patented uh, invention which performs something almost like a fuzzy logic of identity. So instead of seeing the user's identity as something that's taxonomic, that is, you're just in one category based upon your set of features, that is, you're a jazz listener if you've only listened to jazz, or you're a, a punk rock listener if you've only listened to that genre of music, Instead, we trace the trajectory of your choices. That is, you say you listen to one type of music every morning, another one every evening, and we can customize the experience to those changes. And we also look at the degree of membership in these kind of categories to trigger experiences. And so in Grayscale, we use that platform to implement a story which is a kind of workplace training system around sexism in the workplace. And the aim is to make this kind of uh, engagement First, it should be more compelling. Uh, probably a lot of us have done the kind, of the kind of corporate training around these kind of issues, which typically measures just completion rate. Right? It doesn't actually measure anything such as, did you reflect, did you learn, did you change your perspective? And also, it's typically, I hate to say, but somewhat turgid content which just means that it's not really made to maximize the storytelling potential and to raise the kind of challenges of the real physical world. And so in this system, you're, it's automatically categorizing users, sexist or non-sexist behaviors as you exhibit them, making choices as you navigate this uh, email system as a temporary HR manager. So what are we measuring in this? Uh, so using Mesereau's definition, we're looking for self-reflection, in fact, critical self-reflection. That is, an individual's re-examination of the presuppositions that inform their beliefs, thoughts, and actions. So it looks like a typical streamlined kind of email system. Uh, you have all the typical sort of things that are implemented in the simulation, your spam folder, your notes, etc. And as you have different kind of uh, inquiries come in, you're choosing responses to them. So this is uh, one here that is uh, to Robert, Robert Lavender sending to all of the employees. Our company has a dress code for a reason. Yoga pants are A, unprofessional, and B, distracting. This is an office, not a gym, and so on. Right, so we have a lot of different types of scenarios. I mean, this is just a, one that verges towards the humorous, but there are other ones that also verge towards the, uh, the more kind of harrowing. That is, the model we're using actually encodes both hostile sexism as well as what's called ambivalent sexism, issues like protective paternalistic attitudes or complementary gender differentiation. And you know, so you have other kind of scenarios such as this. You get different resumes, but different adjectives used to describe them and so on. And then as you make your choice, you say that it's this distracting comment, that's the issue, or that it's not your responsibility to police your coworkers' clothing, and so forth. The back-end system is actually modeling your degree of sexism and type of sexism and changing the eventuality of the narrative. Right. Yeah, so actually, there are a lot of different types of sexism that are being modeled within the, you know, within the system. And then again, it's modeling your trajectory of uh, showing them. Is it monotonically increasing or fluctuating and so forth? And so all of this actually leads to a very large number of eventualities to give a fine-grained kind of uh, uh, representation of the phenomenon in the workplace. So we have also different kind of thematic endings. And so depending on your choices, you might have uh, the, the company might have realized that morale in your branch would have been better if you had intervened more uh, and uh, so on. Or if a positive one, still it's not seen by the, by the corporation as only universally positive. In this case, you know, positive in the sense that you've been non-sexist because uh, in the end, if the trend doesn't continue, you're, it's, uh, you're, they're going to push for the old way of doing things. Right? So we try to raise the kind of ambivalence and the kind of, uh, 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 the kind of thorny issues that are raised in this kind of situation. So in terms of evaluating it, I can just say very briefly, I'm happy to say more about the study later, but actually one third of the participants in using the system actually showed a disposition towards behavior change. We use this validated instrument, uh, which basically means an empirical uh, social science uh, survey that's been demonstrated to be effective, that shows that people actually 
thought about acting in a different way from the usual beliefs. And actually, all of the participants showed the predisposition. You know, actually, they reflected on the themes of the narrative. We've also built this into online courseware. You know, that is a platform for self-reflection that includes debriefing. That is, afterwards, did you measure what you have uh, learned? And, uh, uh, and can you recall the specific terminology and so forth to distribute this at scale? And as the final example, I'll talk about a project called The Enemy. So this is a VR work. You could say a VR system to humanize the other in the face of war, or VR for peace. So I worked with a war photojournalist I hosted within the lab for uh, quite a while, you know, supported by a grant from the Center for Art, Science, and Technology here. Uh, and uh, he was the director of the project. He's been in many major war zones in Gaza, in Kashmir, in the Balkans. But he began to feel that the images that he took and as they were taken up in uh, news periodicals didn't reflect what he saw on the ground. And so, well, in Cambridge, encountered VR for the first time and directed this uh, VR work that went on to a great uh, acclaim. We ended up partnering and collaborating on this, and I worked with him to build a system that measures your proxies for your nervousness and bias, that is, your body language as you go through the experience. 15 people go through the experience at any given time, measuring the reactions of all of them to customize the VR experience for each user. It's, it was shown at the MIT Museum, it's been shown in a number of different kinds of venues, at Tribeca at Film Festival and so forth. It's about the size of a room such as uh, this one, so it's a large scale kind of uh, exhibition. And all of the combatants within it are the real physical world combatants. It's meant to be a journalistic work. So there's body scans, say, of the combatants in Gaza taken you know, outside the mines in the, uh, 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 or in Congo, for example, or with the gang members in El Salvador. It's all their real body language, it's all really them. There's also an AR version of this as well. We also push back so you can get information about the conflicts themselves to say, how are you related to it in the end? And so I wanna end just with a video, which is a trailer about the work so you can get a sense of what the piece looks like and then I'll wrap up. Too close to really phenomenal. The enemy was born out of my frustration as a photojournalist and war correspondent. For almost 20 years, I have photographed conflicts and witness the consequences of huge geopolitical shifts. When I became a father, I simply knew I could not keep working on the front lines. Yet, I was not done trying to understand wars. My friends in Israel, when they know I'm heading for Gaza, can't help themselves but to wish me luck and to stay safe. They believe a lot of people in Gaza are irrational. Also, when I spend weeks working in Gaza and I'm about to return to Israel, my Palestinian friends are telling me the exact same thing. Be careful there. The project is rooted in my experience as a war photographer, going from one side of the front line to the other and finding that the fighters' dreams, hopes, and nightmares are often more similar than they are different. So there is a bigger story than the war itself, and this is the one I want to explore and share. For the enemy, I am using the latest technologies in virtual and augmented realities so you can engage directly with the combatants and meet them hear them, and feel them the way I did. In many parts of our worlds, 
you create an enemy as a kid without having met your enemy because the society around you has created an enemy in the other. So the question is, could I be you if I was on the other side? So this question at the very end is actually implemented within the system. That is, there are a variety of different kind of effects you know, that are triggered by your body language. But in the very end, you have a space for decompression, we found, because a lot of people found a kind of, uh, uh, to be a very emotionally uh, charged kind of experience. So we had a decompression space within the virtual reality system. And in there, you see a virtual mirror. You move around, you see that the soldier is moving with you, that is, you have become one of the soldiers by the end. And in fact, you have become the one that you were least comfortable with as you went through the experiences. Uh, if you were raised like your enemy, that means you could be your enemy, is this final metaphor. Other feedback includes the ambient lighting. That is, if you're very nervous, then the cloud cover comes in through the skylights and the ambient light uh, diminishes within the space, where you have a lot of different types of feedback as you go through the kind of experience triggered again by your body language. We've done a number of different kind of works. These are just a couple, ranging from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Liberia to modeling racial and ethnic socialization to using virtuality for online learning and a, 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 for, a, of uh, STEM topics for underrepresented youth. Uh, so these are just a few of our kind of uh, works, but I, hope, I think that it's at least an introduction to the kind of scope of what we do. So in conclusion, we feel that innovation and virtuality is crucial because nearly everybody these days uses technologies of uh, virtuality. And again, our approach to engineering and creative practices pushes the expressive potential of technologies of virtuality, simulates social and cognitive phenomena, and intrinsically considers the social cultural impacts. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.